Does everybody here know what duckies are? Duckies? Duckies. They're kind of like rubber... Rubber ducky? Rubber, <laughs> rubber slippers, in my case. Uh, my wife doesn't like when I wear them, but I like to wear them when I cut the grass, for example. Well, it happened that uh, this weekend, I stepped on a piece of fine wire that made its way all the way up through the uh, sole of my slipper, we'll call it, and into the flesh of my left foot. Well, thankfully, Roberta grabbed tweezers and with some finesse removed the piece of wire. Now, in our second lesson today, St. Paul speaks not of a fine wire, in the foot, but about a thorn in the flesh. Now, we need to know and to recognize that St. Paul is speaking figuratively, not literally in this case. But how do we know that? How do we know that? What is the thorn that St. Paul is talking about? And why would this matter to the church in the year of our Lord 2021 anyway? Well, I thought it might be good if we first had a look at what some people have interpreted what St. Paul is talking about as far as the thorn in the flesh. And there's been much speculation on this. There has been great theological study over the years as to exactly what he meant. So let's look at some interpretations that actually miss the mark in interpreting the passage. And if you've heard these, well, God bless you. Some scholars and some writers imply that he had some ailment, some illness, which Christ refused to heal for St. Paul. Uh, there's also been headache, earache, fleshly temptations, speech impediment, malaria, partial blindness, even epilepsy. Now, deciding for oneself what a scripture passage or phrase means or what interpretation makes sense to me, is this without consequence? Just go, have a go at it privately. Read the, read the Bible, have a go at it privately, interpret the scripture to mean what I think it means. That's okay, right? Well, we might want to take a second to look at that because that couldn't be further from the truth. And this is called making up one's own, are you ready for it? Making up one's hermeneutic. Not Herman Munster. Not Herm the new tick, or the old tick for that matter. Hermeneutic. Making up one's hermeneutic. Hermeneutic. It's a fancy theological term for faithful biblical interpretation. And to have a faulty hermeneutic or way of interpreting the scripture has led to tragic, tragic consequences over the years. Even if one is very sincere in the way they attempt to interpret the scriptures with their hermeneutic, even if they can argue that what they see and read is valid philosophically, it still doesn't matter. But the reality remains that one is free to say the scripture says what I say it says, but remember there are consequences to this. Without the fullness of the truth in the church interpreting Holy Scripture, we, we know this painfully in the world. What comes to mind when I say, Branch Davidian. Does that mean anything to anybody? How about the People's Temple? 
Do you recall that? How about the name Jimmy Jones and the People's Temple? 915 people died following Jimmy Jones' hermeneutic, his interpretation of the scriptures. They all drank the Kool-Aid. Heaven's Gate. Do you remember the hale Bop Comet? Yes, that's Bonnie Nettles and Marshall Applewaite. 31 or 39 people took their own lives because of their faulty interpretation of one chapter in the Holy Scriptures. That's Revelation chapter 11. That need we talk about the horrors of slavery? In quotation marks, proved in the scriptures, or the crusades, or the inquisitions over the years. The private interpretation of Holy Scripture is not without tragic consequence. And we'll see more of this as the days go on. But thank God, thank God that God is with us. So some might say, well, Ray, that's kind of on a grand scale, but what about a little closer to home? Do you have any examples there? Well, I can tell you this, that there are Christian people, Christian supposedly people, that are following the hermeneutic, the interpretations of some church leaders, that think that the healing that is miraculous, the miraculous healing stopped in the first century. So how could I ever expect to be healed in this day and age? I don't have a chance, you know, even St. Paul didn't get healed, so there's no way I can because the healing stopped in the first century anyhow. People actually teach this. People actually take it in and they live their lives in light of that. And people follow the interpretation of some without Christ's authority in the church. So the church must be wise and appeal to the Holy Spirit, to appeal to the Holy Scripture as a whole. Holy Scripture is a unit. It's not just a bunch of verses here and there that we grab whatever we want to back up our position. We have to cling on to holy tradition, what the great saints, how they have interpreted scripture in accordance with the Holy Spirit. And then we speak with the authority of Christ in the church, with Christ's hermeneutic, what Christ Jesus says this means in the holy scripture. Remember the road to Emmaus? What happened there? And he opened our minds to the scripture. We need Christ. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the body of Christ, the church, and Christ as the head of the church to rightly interpret scripture. Maybe I'll change that word rightly. Truthfully, I should say. So where did the people that said that the, that the uh, healings ended in the first century, how did they run afoul? Well, remember, you've got to take scripture as a whole, okay? St. Paul didn't get healed, well then that means it's all over with in the first century. No, because if you look at the whole of scripture, Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Doesn't just stop there. Christ is the same. You've got to have all of the scripture. It all has to come together. So private interpretation without the authority of holy scripture and holy tradition in the holy church, it often involves what we call cherry picking. You cherry pick a verse here. You cherry pick, I don't like that one. That's overripe or overused. Uh, no, that one's, I don't like that one. Uh, that one's got a pit in it. I think they're all supposed to have pits. It's also got a fancy theological word called eisegesis. 
meaning we take out of that what we want, not what is actually there. So people cherry pick. This is a, a very popular way of, of doing this, their hermeneutic, their way of interpreting the scripture. Uh, but it's a personal thing. It comes with somebody going, oh my gosh, I see something that's never been there before. And there, the person is always adding or subtracting from what the church has believed everywhere, always and by all. Okay, how about some examples of this? Who knows the name Marcion? No? Marcion. He was in the first century, a first century heretic. Some people call him the Swiss cheese heretic. You know what his idea was? If you get rid of all the Old Testament, and you get rid of all the Old Testament quoted in the New Testament, then everything will be a heck of a lot easier to understand. So you can imagine what his Bible looked like. A bunch of slits and holes all the way through it. But how about adding to the Holy Scripture? Well, for instance, we all know that Bible passage, God helps those that help themselves, right? You remember that passage? Well, where's the wah, wah? Surely that's true? No. God helps those that help themselves? No, not in the scripture. You know where it comes from? The Greek philosophers. The gods help those that help themselves. And there was a fellow, and I'll have to find his name here. Where did it go? Um, Algernon or Algernon Sidney. He first changed the wording from gods to God. And then you know who made it popular? Benjamin Franklin did. Benjamin Franklin, 1736, he used the quote in his book, Poor Richard's Almanac. I hear people quoting that all over the place. Or maybe you have too, I don't know. God helps those that help themselves. Maybe I've used it myself, I don't know. But that's adding to the scriptures. It's not, it's not there. It may sound good, but it's not in the scripture. So how then do we interpret the Holy Scripture with the fullness of truth and with the authority of the church, with Christ as the head of the church? Well, we start with the church. We start with the mind of Christ. We start with the Holy Spirit. And we find out something amazing that Scripture actually helps us to interpret Scripture. That's why we need all of Scripture. You can pluck out here and there all over the place and make the Scripture sound like it's a joke, that it, that it uh, contradicts itself even. But we use the entire scripture, not a favorite verse here or there. Well, how do we go about this? Well, for instance, I'm not in the Holy Scripture, at least not the times I've read it through. Anyhow, maybe, maybe you saw my name there. But the wire in my fleshly foot is not in the Holy Scriptures. But where might we look in the Holy Scriptures for a thorn in the flesh, like St. Paul mentions? And is this figuratively, or was there actually a chunk of tree branch in his foot? Or was it figuratively meaning he was ill in some way? How do we find out? How do we know what is the fullness of the truth? Well, first we search the Holy Scripture and we look for the word thorn or we look for the phrase thorn in the flesh. Well, how do we do that? Well, Dr. Google is great for that. Check out, do a Google search on it. And lo and behold, or if you don't have the internet, you can check out a concordance, you can check out a 
a Bible dictionary or a, a Bible encyclopedia. If you don't have the internet, you don't have any of those, talk to me afterwards, I can get you one. And then you proceed to find out what meaning that word or phrase means within the Holy Scriptures elsewhere. How does it fit? How is this used? This phrase that St. Paul is using. Because remember, St. Paul is bathed in the Old Testament Scriptures. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knows the Scriptures inside and out. Well, if we were to do that, a Google search, as it were, we would find this. Thorns in your sides. Thorns in your sides. We find that in Numbers 33, 35 and Judges 2, verse 3. We will find thorns in your eyes, which is in Joshua 23, verse 13. We find thorns in Ezekiel 2, 6, and a thorn in Ezekiel 28, 24. We also see thorns with the crown of thorns, but we know those are real literal thorns in the head. So that's not even part of this. So in finding these other mentions of thorns or thorn in the eye or thorn in the flesh, we find that in all of the places that this is used figuratively, it's not used literally. And that's used consistently to mean that. That's how we can use scripture to interpret scripture, that it all agrees. And what does it mean? In the scriptures, it means fiercely hostile adversaries or opponents or formidable enemies of God's people. That's what a thorn in the eye or a thorn in the flesh or a thorn in whatever means in the Holy Scriptures. And there's no other literal one except the crown of thorns on Jesus' head. There's no other metaphorical use of a thorn in the flesh to mean illness or epilepsy or whatever else people have said down through the ages. And St. Paul being well-schooled in the scriptures, he, he wouldn't have written this. A thorn was given me in the flesh to mean anything other than an adversary. An adversary that persistently hounded him from place to place, from day to day, to deny Christ or to trick other people into some other kind of Christ. Why is this important? I don't know. Do you think it's easier to become the church these days? Do you think the church is seen as irrelevant these days? By many it is. I don't know about you, but I want to know that I'm standing on the solid rock. I want to know that I'm standing on the truth. I want to talk with authority and speak with authority. I don't want to say the truth is what I say it is. No, I want to be able to say the church has always said this. We stand with the church. We don't stand alone and try to argue our own position from our own brain as it were. And St. Paul, of course, speaks of these great opponents, these hostile enemies of God's people in chapter 11, just before our reading for this morning. And he's, he actually says how he suffers in his flesh day in and day out. Five times I have received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I have been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I have been shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been adrift at sea. Who put him out to sea? <laughs> On frequent journeys, danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers and sisters. 
as he tells the church in the second lesson this morning. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of myself. No, for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. That means I don't stand up here and spout some new theory that I figured out about the scriptures and write four or five books about it and make the speaking junket. That's not what it's about. Because when I am trying to be strong in myself, I become weak. But if I am weak and I know that I don't know it all, but Christ does, and in the church we find the fullness of truth, for the church is the pillar and bulwark of the truth, then that's something that I and you can stand on no matter what is going on in this old world. St. Paul expected that the Lord would deliver him. He prayed three times about it. But the Lord confided in St. Paul and said, because of the exceptional character of the revelations that you have been given, that you're not going to be completely delivered from these ongoing torments of these anti-Christ people or instead of Christ people that want to follow the evil one's ways. And these thorns in the flesh, they will help with the possibility of you becoming a spiritual prideful person. I have visions. I speak in tongues. I heal people. No. No. I am humble and lowly of heart, Jesus says. Come unto me. Be yoked with me. We cooperate with Christ. It's a God and human effort together in Christ. When I am weak, I am strong. Why? Because it's the eternal grace of God, the power of the Holy Spirit working within each and every one of the baptized faithful. My grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness. How do we know this? Can we check this against scripture? And what do we find? We find our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For the powerful, powerful love of God is revealed, not concealed, on a man, a God-man from Nazareth, hanging on a cross for you and for me. There's the weakness and the death of Christ that perfects and protects the human race if we're willing to trust and obey. So each of the baptized faithful say with St. Paul, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. What did John the Baptist say? We need to check this against scripture. I must decrease that he might increase, meaning Christ. Therefore, I'm content with weaknesses. I'm content that people think I'm goofy for being a Christian or worse. I don't mind the insults. I endure any hardships that people put on me or persecutions or calamities for the sake of Christ. Forever I'm weak, I'm strong. The messenger of Satan, St. Paul means, are those that belittle him, those that fight against him, and the gospel of Christ. Those that cast St. Paul into prison, that beat him, that led him away, to be martyred. He lost his head by the sword. They were simply doing the evil one's business. They will always be in our midst, these folk, even to the end of the age. But then, 
something will change. Each verse must be checked by including all of the Holy Scripture or we have a faulty way of interpreting Scripture. Cherry picking verses, personal private interpretation, no matter how wonderful, and no matter how many books are written on the subject and how sincere the person is, misses the mark. St. Paul's weakness is evil people persecuting and martyring him. That's the thorn in the flesh. But his strength in all of this is the eternal power of God's grace, the Holy Spirit. And this, and this applies to all the church, those who daily take up their cross and in the sufficiency of God's grace endure their thorns in the flesh, those that scoff at you or make fun of you or worse, or try to coax you away from Christ in some way. Know this, and the king will say, I tell you the truth, and you did it to one of the least of my brothers and sisters. You were doing it. To me. We suffer not alone. 